opportunity to be here today in, in order to talk to Galveston County and its residents. So this is a fantastic opportunity for me to be able to introduce myself. So for those of you who do not know me, my name is Christy Walsdorf and I am running for judge of the 122nd District Court here in Galveston County. It is just a countywide position. It is a very important court. This court handles both civil felony cases and it is one of the many courts that are just really important to regular people here in our county. So I am a trial attorney. I have almost 20 years of experience and I have practiced both in civil law and in criminal law. I have practiced locally. I am in actually certified to practice as a practitioner in the state of Florida and in the state of Texas. I have got licenses to practice in federal court. And for those of you who do not know me, um, I am a St. Regis Mohawk Indian. So I am actually licensed to practice back in my home tribe back in Northern New York state. So I am running to be judge here in the 122nd because in the course of recent times, I have determined that the powerful and the privileged are really here to take away our rights, right? So if I were to sit on the bench, I would be able to protect your liberty. I would wanna protect your freedom and I would wanna protect your safety. So at the end of every day, all we all want is to feel safe and protected. When we or our loved ones leave our home every single day, what we want most of all is for them to come back safe and sound and in one piece. What I have seen over the course of my practicing here in Galveston County is that for some people, justice is not equal. It is not equally applied and it is not equally handed out amongst our peers in the court system. So, my policies will ensure that you are going to have more money in your pocket, more money is going to be spent in our community, and we're going to have more personal safety. Now, I am running on the Democratic ticket, but that does not mean that I am not somebody who recognizes how everybody feels, and I'm not one of you. So I have lived here in the county for over a decade. My kids went to ball high. Between my husband and myself, we've got five children. I'm a mother and I live right here across from Moody Gardens. This is where we have created our home for many, many, many years. I am a longtime participant in this community and I really consider myself one of us. I think it's important to have somebody who is local on the bench because when somebody sees and thinks the way that we see and think and feel, then we know that they're going to understand where we're coming from, right? So whether you have yourself who has been pulled into the court system, or you have a family member, or you have a friend, you want to be sure that the person who is deciding your fate or your family's member's fate understands the law, knows how to apply it, and is going to be fair when they do it. So a little bit about my background. I already mentioned that I am a St. Regis Mohawk Indian. My mother is a full blood Mohawk and my dad is just a regular white guy. So one of the um, things that I've really grown up knowing is the differences that can be between people just because of the way they look and how they act, right? My mom always tells stories about how it was when she was, when I was little, she would push me around town and she was always afraid that people were going to say, where'd you get that white baby? Because I look like my dad. So I have always been very aware and very cognizant of the inequality and how some people have to fight more than other people just to get kind of the same things. I think that comes from my background being a minority. And I think it comes from my background being a woman. So I know what it's like to have to struggle. I know what it's like to have to work harder than other people. And I know here in Galveston County that there are people who are specifically targeted. Now, our justice system strives to be equal towards everybody. That's just not always the case. There are certain people who, for instance, minorities and people who don't have the same funds as everybody else, who get pulled over more often than their other counterparts. Minorities and people of color, when they are pulled over, are more likely to be arrested in our county. Once they are arrested, they are more likely to remain incarcerated. And when they 
finally are adjudicated, if they are adjudicated, they are more likely to get harsher sentences than their counterparts. That does not have to be the case. So we need somebody who sits on the bench who has seen both sides of the issues, right? We need somebody who is going to be able to apply the law equally. So I've always been somebody who was willing to stand up and fight for justice. So I think I learned that from my dad. My dad was a union representative in the UAW when he worked for General Motors. He worked in the plants. So I saw my dad kind of really advocate for the people on the floor where he worked who were not given the same opportunities as everybody else. So this really stuck with me. When I first became a public servant, I was an assistant public defender. When I practiced here in Galveston County, I was a solo practitioner. And in the course of me practicing as a solo practitioner, I was really able to see firsthand how the county treated certain people. One of the things I think that Galvestonians and, and people in the county will remember is that the Galveston County court system, its judges and its participants were sued by the ACLU a couple of years in a case called Booth versus the Galveston County. And in that case, what was happening was is certain people were being denied bail based on an arbitrary system. So our constitution says that you are supposed to be released depending on certain factors without bail. It is something that every judge is supposed to consider. But what the ACLU found out was the judges here in Galveston County were simply rubber stamping what the police and the DA said somebody was going to get for a bond. And that's just not the law. So over the course of litigation, we, the taxpayers, ended up having to pay untold dollars, but we know it was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to defend this lawsuit. I was actually somebody that stood up and acted as a witness in the federal case. I went to federal court and I stood up and I advocated for those who were unable to do it for themselves. And I told the truth. So I have never been one to shy away from doing the right thing. So one of the other things that I see recently is something that's taking away our rights, um, more specifically the Supreme Court case, right, that just came out, the Dobbs decision. So as a female and somebody who has children her herself, I have a daughter, I was especially concerned with the way the court is going, and I don't see that it is stopping anytime soon, right? So what we know now is today, me as a woman, I literally have less rights than the husband I married, than the son that I bore, and the father who helped create me because of this decision. This decision means that we women are actually second-class citizens who do not have full control over our bodies, whereas our counterparts, men, do have absolute control over their bodies. This I have a problem with. And what I worry about is the courts have broadcasted that they really want to take another look at some of these cases that we have considered for years and years and years to be precedent. So one of the cases that I'm concerned with has to do with, with LGBT rights, right? So one of the cases the court has considered re-examining is a case that took place right here in Texas, and it was only in 2003 in the Lawrence v. Texas case that actually decriminalized certain sexual acts, sodomy. So before 2003, you could actually go to jail for what happened in your bedroom but we've got those protections now. That is something that is now going to be under reconsideration, in my opinion, by the Supreme Court. Just as our voting rights have come under fire and they have been taken away from us, women's rights have been taken away from us, minority rights have been taken away from us, the LGBTQ um, people now are really looking with a bullet on their, on their a target on their back because these, are cases in case law that have provided us privileges and rights that we've all come to think of as commonplace. But if we're listening to where the court is broadcasting, those are actually cases that reconsider, they're reconsidering bringing back up. The Supreme Court actually just went back into session yesterday and we know that they are taking up cases on affirmative action and gay rights. So that is something that definitely concerns me. And that is something that makes me want to get on the bench. So 
some of the things that I really thought about what I wanted to do if I were to be on the bench was one, bail reform. So we talked a little bit about that. My policy is going to save the taxpayers money because I'm actually going to follow the law. When I follow the law, nobody's going to sue us, including the ACLU. So the ACLU actually brought up the same lawsuit in Harris County. But as it turns out, Harris County and other judges were like, oh, you're right. We were violating the law. Let's work with you and let's make it better and let's make a change. They have actually made a huge change. And while people think that if they are being released without paying a substantial money bond, it means that these people are going to go out and automatically commit more crimes. Studies have shown and the science shows that's simply not true. People who are released on a non-monetary bond, a rec personal recognizant bond, are actually more likely to come back to court and face the consequences. So that's a good thing. One of the other things that I'm very much passionate about is alternative resolutions. So this would mean things like drug court and diversionary programs. One of the things that people don't realize is we have a drug court here in Galveston County for people who really think that they have a drug problem and they have been charged with a criminal act. They're allowed to apply to get into a program that kind of diverts them, if you will, out of the court system. What this means is they are on a heightened kind of hybrid probation where it's like on steroids. They are given training. They are um, under supervision. A lot of times they are in halfway houses. They have to do extra monitoring and extra drug testing, but they're also given counseling and they're given help to help overcome these addictions. A lot of times people act out and they say steal things or they're doing drugs because of their addiction. Now, keeping the drug corp full and keeping it full of people who are going to utilize the program is really important to me. The funding is there. It's a win-win situation. If we can get somebody out of the prison system so we, the taxpayers, don't have to pay for that, and we can give them the help that they need so they never go back and, and do any more criminal charges ever again, that's going to benefit the entire community. I am a big proponent for finding ways to help people. That is definitely one way that we can help people. Now, on the other hand, I have represented in the course of doing criminal work, a lot of people that I know simply don't deserve a second chance. So just because I would be sitting on the bench and I know that people have this ability to be diverted and have a second chance, not everyone's going to qualify for it. So one thing that I don't talk a lot about myself is that I've got, I've got five kids and actually one of those kids was uh, attacked. He was an adult. He was attacked here in Galveston County by somebody who was already on probation. I went to court and I sat in the proceeding for the state to violate that person's proceeding because that person committed another criminal act specifically against one of my kids. Now, the court system in that case failed me and in my opinion, failed everybody in this county because the evidence was clear. My child was attacked by somebody with a gun who threatened him and his probation was not violated. I'm here to tell you folks, I'm not going to be soft on crime. If you've had a second chance and you're blowing that chance and you're blowing it so that you are changing somebody's life forever, I might just consider giving the maximum penalty if it's recommended to me. So once again, while I will not hesitate to do the right thing, if that means somebody putting somebody in jail for a very, very, very long time because they deserve it, I'm going to do it. So when it comes to equal justice, we touched on that a little bit, and that is actually something that is part of my program and something that I want to ensure happens. So one of my slogans is, is whether you come from jail or Yale, you are going to get equal justice in my courtroom. So what that means is I'm going to hold people accountable. I'm going to hold individuals accountable, whether it is a civil suit, you are going to be forced to show the evidence to prove your case. Just like in the criminal system, the DA's office, the prosecutors are going to have to show their evidence in order to prosecute their case. If somebody is not being honest 
or they are not providing all of the evidence, I'm going to hold that person accountable, whether they are a police officer or a probationer. And when it comes to sentencing, I will be sure that somebody is being sentenced based on that particular crime in that particular circumstance and their history. I am not just going to throw some random sort of penalty against somebody because of what I think they look like or what I think they might do in the future. That's what equal justice really is all about. It is not just about judging somebody and stereotyping somebody. That is not something that I'm interested in doing and I never will. One of the other things that I put on my platform is marijuana reform. While I will only be able to take care of cases that are brought to me about marijuana, I would like people to know that I am a very strong advocate for reformation and decriminalization of marijuana. This is not something where I actually have just jumped on the bandwagon about this recently. Um, I graduated from college quite a long time ago, quite a few decades ago. And actually when I was in college, I was making commercials for Normal. That is the group for the national um, organization and legalization of marijuana reform. And so I have been a big proponent and a big advocate to decriminalize marijuana for quite a long time. I think it's clear the studies show and the law shows that people of color are disproportionately arrested and disproportionately sentenced when it comes to marijuana charges. I just think that's a bunch of bogusness, right? So I would treat people equally, but when it comes to marijuana reform, one, I don't think it should be illegal. And in the state of Texas, the legislature has seen fit already to decriminalize it as far as making it medicinally available. However, the state hasn't gone far enough to actually have any dispensaries. So even though you are allowed here in Texas to use marijuana medicinally, you can't get it. The state needs to go further and they need to complete what they have promised this, the people of Texas, which is you can now at least use it for medicinal purposes. I too, however, am in favor of completely decriminalizing it. I think we should regulate it and I think we should educate people about the benefits of it. We've just barely scratched the surface of what marijuana can do for people with cancer, for people with epilepsy and for people, people with dementia. I've seen, and I know people in other states who have taken advantage of what you can do from using those sorts of um, marijuana and the different strains and the different processes for actually taking it. And it really, really does help. We as taxpayers can get some sort of relief, right? Because if we're taxing marijuana, then that means we are going to have more money as a whole. There is absolutely nothing wrong with filling the state coffers, with putting a tax on marijuana. We do that for cigarettes. We do that for alcohol. It can be treated and monitored and regulated the absolute same way. So those are some of the things that I do feel very passionate about. I would encourage everybody to go to my website, christyforjudge.com. You can check out my social media. You can check out my Facebook page. I do talk a lot a bit about how I'm a local. Again, I think that's super, super important. Um, I'm just like you guys. I live here at my house. I sleep here every night. And I want to do the best thing for Galveston County. So again, my name is Christy Walsdorf. I'm running for judge of the 122nd District Court. Very important court. It oversees diversion programs, felony, criminal charges, and also civil cases. Now, I want to put a quick plug in for the civil cases. People don't think about the businesses who are really benefit from having a judge on the court that clears the way for people who are either injured or is going to get rid of those cases that actually don't much matter. So if, in my opinion, the law shows that, that somebody who is a business owner is complying with the law, and this is a frivolous lawsuit, I'm going to be the first one to throw that out, because I know that there are cases that don't belong in our court system, and we need to free up for people who are truly victims and for people who would truly benefit from the court system. Um, so with that, ladies, I will let you enter in with any questions that you might have for me that I can answer. We are here. So are here. Uh, no worries. You're, um, you're, electric, you're, the, glow is, you? the glow is coming through the uh, window. 
Yes, it's started to cut the sun. If you could shut your, yes. <laughs> That's better because I did it was not fine at the beginning when you started. Oh, look at that. Yes, yes. <laughs> but it, I do have some questions that came in for you. As you were talking. So nice. Yes. The question, I'm going to go one by one. Legalizing marijuana. How will that work? for youth who have already received charges for that? Well, I think the legislature can do, well, they can do anything they want with that. So there are certain states who have made it retroactive. So if you have already been charged, they let people out of jail and out of prison. I think that would be something that the legislature should certainly consider doing. Now, it is going to vary whether it is a charge under the federal law or under the state law. But when it comes to our state, our state legislatures can do what they want. And I would recommend that they do actually release people if they were to make a law that said it is not illegal to possess marijuana under a certain amount. There's no reason those people should remain in custody. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. I agree. And I believe it would save us a lot of taxpayer money keeping them in incarcerated as well as you talked about the tax revenue from this this sale so uh, i agree 100 percent with that I absolutely will and you know another thing that that people don't realize is that here in galveston county people are charged with all sort of drug charges right but as part of the state's job they're supposed to test every drug that they get in to actually prove that what somebody has is a drug that is something that should always happen in a case, but there are some instances, for instance, I represented somebody who had a drug history. She was a black woman and she didn't feel as if she had the ability to stand up for herself anymore. You know, she'd been so run down by life that mm -hmm. she just really thought, you know what, I did wrong. I'm going to jail. I'm not going to fight for myself. And so when she was charged with possession of drugs, she took a plea deal that she thought was in her best interest instead of risking going through prison for the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. Now, as an attorney, it's my job to advise, but I can never tell somebody what to do. So my client went to prison. Lo and behold, by some miracle in the grace of a higher power, I received a drug lab report after she'd been sent to prison that said no drugs detected. Do you know here that those doors of the prison did not open up automatically? I had to continue to fight for her. I had to go to file a writ of habeas corpus to get her out of prison. Then she was put in the county jail. And then I had to go in front of the judge because the district attorney's office would not agree that she was actually innocent, even though their state agency had a lab report that said no drugs detected. So then I had to continue the process. I did finally get my client out of jail. And afterwards, I went back and helped her sue the state of Texas for wrongful incarceration. I was able to get her a life-changing amount of money because she was wrongfully incarcerated. Good. So I think when it comes to drugs, we need to be very, very aware of what this county is doing to our community. Thank you for that. Uh, I got another question here. I'm trying to follow the screen here. <laughs> okay. The alternative court solutions. Someone wants to know what that means. So an alternative court solution is something different than the normal course. So the normal course, when you get charged with a criminal offense, is to work out a deal with the DA or go to trial all within the court system. An alternative means of, of justice, a diversion program, is that you, instead of going in front of the court and having a trial, instead you are put into what's like a hyper kind of probation and you are monitored you are given counseling you are given the opportunity to keep that charge off of your record and if you complete everything that they ask of you to do then those charges are thrown out they're not put on your record and you just go on about your way without a conviction that will follow you for the rest of your life Okay. Okay. That's good. I had another question. 
trying to trying to look at uh what is bail reform and the uh, another question is Dobbs decision so there's two different questions but one is what is bail reform and then what does it mean what does the Dobbs decision mean okay so first of all, bail reform. So bail is what you have to pay. Bail refers to money. So under the current law, as it stands, when you get charged with a crime, you do not have to put up money to get out of jail during the pendency of your case. That is called posting a personal bond. The law literally is you should be able to give your word that you're going to return to court. That is the presumption. That is already in our criminal code of procedure, chapter 17. The court has to consider the least restrictive means in order to keep the case going, but keep society safe. Usually that means just getting out without having to post anything. So here in Texas, the governor did not like following that. Galveston County did not like following that. And so what they did is they would automatically say, we're going to ignore the law. You've got to post are usually very, very, very high bond. Otherwise, you're going to stay in jail, even though you are presumed innocent. Mm -hmm. So the court, or I'm sorry, Texas actually passed an Abbott sign. It's called SB6. It is a bill that says all violent cases, even though you are still innocent until proven guilty, you have to post a high monetary bond. So when we talk about bail reform, what we're really talking about is following the law as it's originally written and not this new thing that, that the state of Texas says where you always have to post a high bond to get out of jail. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people are really innocent. You know, you all it takes to accuse somebody of a crime mm -hmm. is a verbal accusation. And then you're going to, if you're put in jail, you're going to lose your house. You're going to lose your job. You can lose your family. Your kids might be put in foster care. Mm -hmm. How does any of that benefit the community? It does not. Okay. And when it comes to the second part, the mm -hmm. Dobbs decision. Okay. So the Dobbs decision was the recent case the Supreme Court ruled where they undid Roe v. Wade. So it specifically said that under Roe v. Wade, when women were allowed to choose for themselves to get an abortion, the court threw that out and said, we, we got that wrong. We're taking that right away. So that's what this new decision did. Instead, it says states, you can monitor it and you can put up any laws that you want. We're not going to trust women to do it. The states are going to do it now. Okay. Okay. Ah. Well, what am I hot? But there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that is Jackie's hot button. You know, we've been really, uh, myself and Jackie, we've been having a lot of roundtable discussions with, with women every other Friday. And we're talking on different subject titles. Then we call it Hot Topic Friday. And one of the things that we did one night, we were talking about voting and the importance of us getting out here voting. And I feel like women, women should flood the streets. But I also say, men, we need y'all out there with us because we are always out there with you guys. And, you know, every time I think about why you would want to take a woman's right to her own body, it is just sickening. And I cannot see how a woman could sit inside and not vote. I just can't. That puzzles me. And women who are, you know, texting are saying, like, why is it there, why is there more fighting going on for women? But I think that there are a lot of fights going on for women. That's one of the things that you're doing. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. I, I think, well, first of all, there's more women than there are men, right? <laughs> yes. Just tiny bit. There's more exactly. of us. Yes. And so all these laws really affect us. And we have been at the forefront for having our rights taken away right now. So yes, I agree. It is extraordinarily important to vote. I think a lot of people don't realize 
how important that vote is, because if they're trying to take it away from you, that should be a clue. It is important. Okay. Mm -hmm. So people like my grandfather who fought on the beaches of Normandy, they fought for our right to vote. Every military veteran is out there fighting and serving their country for us to be able to have that right to vote. So yeah, yes. we need to exercise it because I think you're right. We are stronger together. Yes. And in my opinion, it is going to be young people and it is going to be women mm -hmm. and our brothers and sisters out there who are going to put us over the edge because this is the most important election of our lifetime. Yes. Mm -hmm. Democracy. And I want to say, yeah. historic, I think historically speaking, the reason that women have not come out in droves is two, two, two part. One part is they have learned to be subjugated to their their husband, their father, their male, whoever. And there's no nothing wrong with respecting your husband and respecting your father, but they need to respect you back. And that's where the problem comes in. And women need to understand that being able to exercise the right to vote that we fought for, I mean, we didn't just feed, fight for freedom for um, freedom from slavery or freedom from this freedom. We fought women stood in the streets and fought for the right to vote. So if we don't go out and vote, we are basically telling our ancestors we don't care. Mm -hmm. We don't care what you did. We don't care about the time you spent in jail or the fines you had to pay. We don't care that you cared about us. We need to vote. Sorry platform no. again I, I get off on them so no. sorry Electra any more questions because I have some stuff no I'm passing it off to you I'm passing it off to you. Okay. <laughs> well first thing I'm gonna say Ms. Walsdorf is I am so impressed that you are a Native American um I I don't call myself Native American because I'm not close enough to it I'm six generations out but Lately, I have been working with a specific Cherokee tribe to get their genealogy done, completed. And I have read more books in the last month on Native American history and, and whatnot. And the, and the reason that this all came about, came about was I was telling someone about a historical uh, story about a man and I said a name and a person who was in the audience said, hey, He's my great, 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 great grandfather. Did you know he was Cherokee? I said, uh, no, I didn't know. But now it, it's just fascinating. And not only is it fascinating because it's interesting, but it's fascinating because we are a nation of free people. And it doesn't matter if once upon a time, the leaders in Washington treated you like crap. It doesn't change the fact that here today, you better make a choice to do what you are allowed to do. Because if you don't, there's somebody out there always fighting to take your rights away. Don't let them do it. Don't let them do it. Yeah. Whether you're white, black, yeah. Native American, anything. And one of the ways, the biggest way we can, we can all make our voice heard is through the vote. We're not all great public speakers and we're not all great orators or historians, but those who can, for those who can should be, you should st state your mind. Those who can't, you can silently walk to the voting booth and make your voice heard that way. So there's there's my pitch there. <laughs> and yeah, another so my um my my tribe actually, and so it's interesting. So on both sides of my family, I've really been shown the value of service. So on my dad's side of the family, the white side. We're all military. So my dad served in the military. My grandfather served in the military um, generations back. We've just mm -hmm. been very, very patriotic. And interestingly enough, on the other side, even though you're right, Native Americans historically have been oppressed. Um, our country has not been very kind to us at times. Mm -hmm. But we we actually had several co-talkers. Um, we have a lot of people within our tribe who do serve in the military. And during World War II, there was a group of Mohawks who served as code talkers, just like the Navajos did. So service is really, really just who I am and it's where I come from on, on both sides of my family. 
And, then, and that's something that I ingrained in my kids, you know, we always have to think of, of the others that we can help serve no matter what that is. And no matter how we do it every day, you should try and help somebody do something. Yeah. And, um, I, and I find, you know, with, with the culture that's going on today, I find in my own opinion that I think people are just really afraid, right? I think they're yes. afraid that something is going to be taken away from them or they're going to lose something that they already have. So I find it helpful to just kind of break it down and to talk to people on a, and about everything that we can agree on. We can all agree that we want to be safe. We can all agree that we want our children and family members to prosper. We can all agree that we want to be successful. And, and if we at least start from that place, then I think we've got some common ground where we can start to build from. So I think it's really important to keep that in sight, you know, because a lot of people right now are very angry and they're very motivated, but I think it comes from a place of fear. And if we stop and we just recognize, hey, I'm not going to take something away from you and I'm not going to prevent you from living your best life. Then I think we can all back it down a little bit. Yeah, I agree. Lower the temperature. Lower the temperature. Yes. And that's that creates lower the temperature, increase the safety, the, yes. the, the sense of safety. Yes. I, I do have a, a, another question that, that I was asked. Um, tell me, tell us your feeling about the education system in Texas. Oh, that's a loaded <laughs> question. I know. Uh, how about if we, we narrow it down to public education? Okay, so it, it, it's really difficult. So I, I, um, I went to school in New York. So I was born and raised, you know, right next to the reservation. I got to Texas as soon as I could. <laughs> but um, and there the taxes were high, but we had a really, really good education system. And so I've been able to see the difference because my kids were raised down here in the South and they went through the Texas public education system. And so I really had an interesting firsthand view. Um, I feel one teachers need more recognition and they need more pay yes. and more period. Respect. And absolutely more respect. You pay them more, they're going to get the respect. And I think if you ask the person on the street, if, you know, they would ever like to be a teacher, you're going to get a resounding no, their job is hard. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. But what we need is for the legislature and the governor to loosen up the uh, purse springs and start paying these teachers what they are worth. There is no reason any teacher, and there are too many of them who have got second and third jobs. Yes. That is utterly ridiculous. Ridiculous, mm -hmm. utterly ridiculous. That hurts the entire community. If yes. you've got a teacher who's tired and who's working another job and can't pay for their own kids to get school clothes or take time to take their family out, that is hurting everybody. Okay. My kids aren't being taught. They feel like crap. It's just, it's just a, a waterfall of a nightmare. So I think one, we need to pay teachers better. Two, we we need to have better quality of education. I think it's insane that they're trying to limit what people learn about my people, right? They're trying oh, yes. to rewrite history with this revisionist history. Yes. If my people lived through it, your kid can learn about it. That's, That's right. That's the way that I see it. Right? Yeah, that is so you know, true. I, I felt uh, because of my age, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a young 63 year old. When I was in junior high, I learned Texas history. And I thankfully had a black teacher for Texas history. And she did not pull any punches. But by the time I got to eighth, ninth grade, none of that was even discussed. And I would, you know, I don't know what other kids did, but I would say, wait a second, uh, what about this? What about that? And, and I also had, the opportunity in the seventh grade to be in foster care and be transferred several times. So I got this from several different areas. But when I had the last, the last teacher I had in the seventh grade was this black woman. And I loved her to death because I love history. And I was, I, I read history like novels and, and she fed that need in me. And I, I believe very strongly that we need to we need to be aware of the mistakes of our people 
the people in general have made in the past because that's how we learn for the future. And if we don't learn from the past, we might repeat it. And Absolutely. trust me, look around us. We're on the verge of repeating right now. And it's we scary. Are. So, yeah. And we kids are. are smart. They're curious and they're resilient. This is not going to hold them down if we teach them everything about our history. Right. It is going to make them better, more rounded people. And they will be much more empathetic, I think, to their other classmates and to other people because they are provided more information. Our children are not, our children are resilient. Yes. They're not going to break if they learn the hard truths about reality and about life. So we should give that to them. I agree. I'm, I, yes. I agree totally. So that's yeah. where all of this critical race theory coming from. Is that yeah. even a thing? It's just something they made up. I think it's, I think it's made up. And again, I think it comes from a place of fear. I think if they withhold the information that these kids aren't going to learn it and they're going to start to think just like them. I disagree. You know, if, if kids are going to find a way, they're going to find a way to learn exactly what has been happening outside of their home, outside of their school, because mm -hmm. you can't keep them in a bubble. No. And again, our kids are, re they're resilient. Young people today, just think about what they've been through, not just COVID. They've been through um, yeah. school shootings. I was yeah. getting, um, I, I was getting a service done the other day here in town, and it was just before school started. And it absolutely broke my heart. But there was somebody, an employee there who brought their kid with them. It was a little kid, like going into kindergarten for the first time. And the dad just started talking to him about what school was going to be like. And the dad goes, what do you do if, if, you, if, if they say, if they say, go run, if they say, go hide. Mm -hmm. And this was just like their talk. And he said, I go hide under the desk. Nobody find me there. And I was just like, oh my God, they have incorporated school shootings into their yes. normal talk so that their child will know how to respond and will not be afraid. This is what parents have had to do instead of our government protecting our children. Mm -hmm. Instead, parents have had to decide how we're going to protect them by teaching their kid to go hide under a desk. That's yeah. a bunch of crap. And, yes. and the reason I'm so infuriated about it in, is because we just, um, what is today? On, on Friday, I got a phone call from one of my kids. So my, my child is, in, he's 23, he's working somewhere. And he called me in the middle of the afternoon. And I said, well, it doesn't sound like you're at work. Where are you? He said, oh, no, I just got picked up. I was like, what are you talking about? He was like, somebody just ran into our office and told us to barricade ourselves. There was a shooter at our place of work. And oh, wait. the people that he worked with had the sense of mind to be like, we're not going down like this. They took all of the patients and the employees down a black stairwell and got the heck out of Dodge. And he literally just left the building, walked past all the SWAT teams, just kept going. This Because he has lived through this. He knew he wasn't going to sit there like that. And there are so many of our children who do not have that choice. We have got tiny little babies, kindergartners being mowed down in their schools. And yes. it, it, it used to be incomprehensible because it keeps happening over and over again. It's becoming commonplace. And, th and these Republican taglines of thoughts and prayers and overdoing something is not keeping mm -hmm. our children safe yes because they're not just doing about. anything they're not doing anything they're not they're not and they say oh we should just arm the teachers are you kidding me, are you kidding me? if you get a teacher that um is not grounded and got some things going on themselves you ask them for trouble to give them a weapon mm-hmm why they're no. a teacher and they're not a law enforcement officer. No. Exactly. No. Exactly. Exactly. And to, ex to expect the teacher to take on that role. I mean, coming from the teacher's point of view, I have a friend who, who just, just graduated, just started teaching, and this is her first year. And it is actually terrifying for her that they might start requesting the teacher. She says, I will be, do, do a much better job. Uh, 
getting my kids out of the way than standing there and trying to fight with somebody. She says, I can't do that, yeah, but I can get teachers. Them. We're going to get yeah. people who are saying, no, I'm not going to teach. I, I'm right. not, you know, in that position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, That's right. Yeah. Another, uh, um, I have a friend with several grandchildren and uh, that she adopted and she needed some help with them after school because she was working and I wasn't. So every day after school, I would meet the school bus and get her kids home and, you know, whatnot. And one day, one of her grandchildren came off the bus in tears. And I was like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And he, he, he didn't tell us for the longest time. But he finally said, we had to have a drill today. And they mm. locked the door and they uh, made these loud bells go off. And we had to hide um, under the counter in the back of the, he was in kindergarten, under the counter in the back of the room. And I peed in my pants. I was so scared. And then everybody laughed at me. And I felt so bad for him. Yeah. But at the same time, I wanted to know what to do. But do we have to terrify them? I don't think That's so. what we're doing. That's what we're doing to our children. We are changing their mental health mm -hmm. because of, of the government's inaction. Th these kids have grown up with this. They are a changed generation. They yes. truly are. Yes. I, I do want to also make a point about uh, teachers, uh, parents not appreciating teachers. I feel like over the pandemic, when parents had to teach their children for a year, <laughs> I think maybe there's going to be a lot more parents who are more appreciative of teachers. And if you're yes. not more appreciative of your child's teachers, remember those 18 months. Just think about it and be appreciative of those teachers. Yes. yes. Well, it has been a pleasure having you on tonight. Um, oh. I can be more grateful and honored to have you to come on to Electric Jane's Inspirational Talks. And just know that if it's another, you know, if you want to come on again, we're here. So Jackie is uh, scheduling everyone. Just send an email, we'll get you back on schedule because what you shared tonight is so important. It's so important. And I can tell you, like we've told every other candidate that have came on to this platform, people appreciate it. I'm sitting here and I'm watching the phone and they're saying, she's got my vote. She's got my vote. That this is, you're doing what people like. They're getting the chance to see the candidates instead of just being told to vote for somebody. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And then Jackie, I know you, you might have something. And then you're going to have the last words and close us out as the candidate. We, we do that. We let you guys have the last word. Okay. Aww. So Jackie. I, I really, um, as always is the case, I, I have trouble ever keeping my mouth shut. I've already said everything. Mm -hmm. I need to say. No. So please, Ms. Walsorf. Give us, give us your last words. <laughs> um, well, first of all, ladies, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm always so grateful just to kind of geek out and talk the law and talk what inspires me and talk about my vision for Galveston County. So again, I, I just want to make this place better because I'm a member of this community and I feel like I could do so good. I have the right experience. I have the right temperament. And given the opportunity, I will really, really make Galveston County proud. So if you need more information, please contact me, contact my campaign. I am at ChristopherJudge at gmail.com. You can email me. You can call me and shoot me a text at 409-454-3761 or go to my, my website, ChristopherJudge.com. We could definitely use all of the support, whether that's financial support or votes or just getting people out to the polls. November 8th and early voting starts on October 24th. So use your vote. They wouldn't try and take it if it wasn't something important. That's right. That's right. Thank you so Thank you, much. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> I'm so inspired. So inspired. Yes. Well, you inspired yes. us too. <laughs> yep, definitely. Definitely. <laughs>